If you don't want to end with failure in life, include God in decision making. Include God in every step, every aspiration, every decision involve God. You want to marry, involve God. Even when you want to divorce, involve God. So let us go to today. What is affecting you? Ask your neighbor, what is affecting you? Tell your neighbor, say, something is affecting us. But what is affecting us? What is affecting you? Something. Why there will be things affecting us while we live? is because Satan is very subtle. Very tricky Satan. When we are focusing, or when we want to focus on our divine course, he brings things that takes our mind off, that disturb us from running the straight race. He's very subtle. Clever Satan. Tricky Satan. I won't say clear, but it's tricky. If you want to know, in one way or the other, if there's anything, I mean, the thing that affects you, if you want to know, the book of First John chapter 2, verse 15 to 19, and that Matthew 10, verse 37 to 39, and that Matthew 25, verse 23, and that book of Mark 4, verse 19. When you go through these books, you will begin to see one or two things that affect a Christian. It might not be all but you might find one or two that affects you. I want to read for me that first John. Chapter 2, from that verse 15. Listen to what it says. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave for. That is the things you desire. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. This is one of the things that affect us. Love of what? Love of what? Love of the world, love of pleasure, the love for the things you see, the cravings. The Bible says, when you are like that, the love of the Father is not in you. When you crave for physical pleasures, the love of God is not in you. Because this world is fading away with its pleasures, with its cravings. But whoever does what pleases God will live forever. This is. This means failure to give Christ his proper position in our heart is the cause of the crisis of our faith, which we are facing today. 
but letting the word of God to have right of way in your life is letting Christ to have a right of way in your life. Colossians 3.16 Letting the word of God to have a right of way in your life is letting Christ have right of way in your life. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the spoken word of Christ have its home within you, dwelling in your heart and mind, permeating every aspect of your being, as you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. You see, the things we desire, the things we crave for, makes it impossible for us to be singing psalms, hymns, and making melodies in our heart. Why? Because the desires and the pleasures of physical, material things take possession of our heart. When you love the world, its cravings and its pleasures, the Bible says the love of God is not in you. Then it becomes impossible for Colossians 3.16 to become a reality, singing psalms, making melodies, in your heart, it becomes impossible because your heart is full of physical pleasures, cravings of things of this world. Satan loses no time in plotting against us. We too, Christians, we should lose no time in committing ourselves to God in prayer. Tell never say Satan loses no time in plotting against us, planning against us, how to topple us, how to overpower us. He loses no time in planning that. We too, we should commit ourselves to God in prayer. I believe I'm clear. Working, doing business, that is two. Being involved in church activities. If they engage us and absorb us, that they hinder our prayer life and it becomes a case in our lives, evil results will always follow. Are you listening to me? Working, that is your job. Doing business and being involved in the church, if it takes your commitment to read your Bible and pray, evil results will follow, even if you are in the church. Because there is no substitute for prayer. Where are you? I made the church. What are you doing? No, we are working. We are working. You go home. No time to pray. You are staying at the church. What are you doing? I am working. This. From there, you go and sleep. This. That if that is the case in your life, evil results will follow. That is why there is evil in the church among Christians. Why? Because we allow what we do to hinder our prayer life. It's not only affecting people that are doing business, busy doing business, making money, or working. I'm a manager. I'm looking for this. Anything that hinders your prayer life, your prayer time, your communion with God. If it becomes a case in your life, evil results will always follow in your life. Yeah. 
what is affecting you. This is what we title our message today. In Matthew 25, 23, and Corinthians 3, 13, the Bible says, it is better to fail in what we do than to let prayer go by neglect. It is better to fail in business, to fail in your church involvement, to fail in your work than to fail or to let prayer go by neglect. You are too busy to pray. Always working, 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 working. Whatever hinders the intensity and the strength of your prayer life also affects the quality and the value of your work. I repeat again. I say whatever affects the strength and the intensity of your prayer life also affects the value and the quality of your work. Read that Matthew 25 from AMP, verse 23. Matthew 25, verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. Nothing is well done in our life without prayer. Well done. Nothing is well done in our lives without prayer. For the simple reason that it leaves God out of the story. If God is not part of your business, what do you call that? Is it business? If God is not part of your marriage, do you call that marriage? If God is not part of your job, your doings, what do you call that? When God is not part of your story. Corinthians 3, 13. Let's continue there. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it. Because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality and character and work of each person's work. Yes. Are you listening to that? Are you listening to that? If God is not part of your story, what do we call that? It's not part of your business. You are doing business. Yes, you are making money. You, you are working hard. If God is not part of it, what do you call that? Because each work will be judged, will be tested, if it was done for the glory of God or for your own glory. Each work. The Bible says it is better to fail in what you do than to allow prayer dissipate. Your prayer life dies. Listen to the woman that gave testimony here, a teacher. After she started praying, after her deliverance, she started producing 100%. It is better to allow your work to fail than to let prayer go by neglect. Working, doing business, being involved in church activities, if it absorbs us 
If it so absorbs us and engages us that it hinders our communion, our commitment to God, if that is the case in your life, evil results will follow. Depression, mental problem, spiritual attack, this, you name all this rubbish Satan manufactures, will become the results in your life. Now she said, a man of God told me, you are not praying. This is what I told you. I said, you are not praying. You are saying depression. And I put my leg, my feet, my shoe on her, and she started vibrating boo, 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 under the power of the Spirit of God. Falling down, the Spirit, yeah, we want to destroy her. We want to kill her. We want to do this. After that, she vomited those personal substances, and she was declared free. She go back. She's now performing at school. No more depression. No more doctor this, no more this, everything is over. Now what she's doing different now. What she never do before, she start praying. Now she's telling now, I'm producing 100%. Prayer. What is affecting us? This is exactly the message I'm preaching to you, what the, the woman was sharing. It's a message. Say, now I advise you, please pray, pray. Don't do anything without prayer. Pray, pray, pray. Live a life of prayer, whatever you do. If you don't want to end with failure in life, include God in decision making. Include God in every step, every aspiration, every decision involve God. You want to marry, involve God. Even when you want to divorce, involve God. You want to leave a church, involve God. We have seen people taking decisions, only to realize later, oh my God, did this, did this person know what she was doing? Look what a, the result of his decision. Why did she divorce? Why did he leave the church? Look what has happened. The worst has come. Why did the person leave the church? Ah, ah, why did this person marry? She was so wonderful. Why did he marry this man, this woman? If you don't want to end with failure in life, include God in every step you take. Involve him. Only to realize people that take decisions. Many people take decisions. We have seen it. Four, five, six years later, we become surprised. Oh, my God. What was this person doing? Did he, she know what she was doing? Look at the outcome. She should not have left this person. She should not have left this place. She should not have destroyed. Man, ask God. If you want to leave, ask God, Father, I want to leave. Give me the grace. Are you allowing? God is the, is the future. He knows that, no, 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 no. This is, you can't afford this. Or he will say, yes, he will release you. And when God releases you, there's no bitterness. There's no anger in your heart. There's no resentment. That is the difference. When you release yourself, what are the results? Bitterness, anger, hatred. You name them. If God release you, no bitterness, no anger, no de- that's how you know God has released me. But in a situation where we are still angry with a person you no longer associate with, you are bitter, it means you released yourself. God was not involved. And evil results will follow. That anger is a manifestation of, of evil results. That bitterness, that hatred, they are the results. The only way to know when God has released you from something, you will be free, clear. You will no longer be thinking evil about the person. Anger, you will not even be repeating the stories of what happened. You keep on saying, oh my God, yes, I remember, but hey, don't worry, life goes on. So, sitting on the story, keep repeating. It's your, uh, you have released yourself. That is why you are still there. Emotionally, you are still there. Spiritually, you are still there. You have not moved on. It's your body that has moved on. What has moved on? Your body. But your emotions, your spirit is still there. And what does this body offer? The main thing about us is our spirit. If your spirit is free, even when you are in prison, 
If your spirit is free, enjoy prison. If your spirit is not free in prison, you be, it is a torment. That's why there are some people in prison that are free, they are laughing, they are better than you emotionally, mentally, because they are free. You, free people, you go everywhere, you do everything, you are in bondage. You are worse than a prisoner because of the things you have harbored in your heart. You are worse than a prisoner. A prisoner who is free is better than you. A prisoner who is happy, who has given everything to God to say, well, let the will of God be done. Well, I will be here up until they release me, my time. I will behave, do this. It's better than somebody who's outside here, who's angry, who's bitter, anger, hatred, resentment, you name all those things. What is affecting you? That's the question. This is what we call self-torture, self-imprisonment. You have imprisoned yourself. You are torturing yourself. Why can't you allow that a, a torture than you torture? Why do you torture yourself? Can you allow, at least if you have been tortured somewhere beyond your power, you are torturing yourself. God help us when we pray. Tell them, I say, God helps us when we pray. A person who does not pray robs himself of God's help and places himself where God will not be interested in whatever he or she does and places God where God cannot help him or her. Because God helps us when we pray. A person who does not pray robs himself of God's help. You are robbing yourself. You ask yourself, why should I pray this? Somebody will come and stand there now and share you, somebody who nearly died, somebody who suffered from depression, he said, for after that, I start praying. I start praying. Now I can, at work, I'm enjoying work. I want to be at work. I want to be with the other stuff. This, my children now, I'm producing. I'm producing. 100%. What is the meaning of that? God helps us when we pray. A person who does not pray helps, I mean, robs himself or herself from God's help and places himself where God will not be interested in whatever you say and whatever he does. Salvation is personal. Can I ever say salvation, salvation is personal? Yes. That Corinthians 3.13, 1 Corinthians 3.13, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. Are you listening to that? Whatever affects our prayer life, whatever hinders the strength and the intensity of our prayer life, also affects the value and the quality of our work because whatever we do is going to be tested. Whatever you have done will be tested by fire. This means salvation is what? It's personal. Philippians 2.12. He says, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. This means salvation is what? Personal. The life of every individual believer, his personal salvation, his peculiar grace, that is his speciality, have their being, their success, their fruitage in prayer. Your success depends on prayer. Your strength depends on prayer. Your salvation depends on your prayer life. Look at 
how vital prayer is. That everything seems to be resting on our prayer. If not, whatever we are doing becomes affected. The value of what we do becomes affected. The quality of the work we do becomes affected. Look at your neighbor say, it seems everything depends on prayer in this life. <laughs> Tell your neighbor say, it seems everything depends on prayer. My strength depends on my prayer life. My salvation depends on my prayer life. The grace God has given me also depends on my prayer life. The peculiar grace. You know we are peculiar beings. We, we are peculiar beings. Are you listening? Yes. My peculiarity depends on my prayer. If I stretch my hand, in the name of Jesus, you vomit. That peculiarity, not everyone can do that. When somebody manifests, I just look. I say, oh, this is mental problem. This is something. That is peculiar grace. It depends on my prayer life. You too, your peculiarity, the peculiar grace in your life, what God has deposited in you, to fulfill your purpose, his will on earth. That is peculiar. It depends on your prayer life. You are to be making money in this world. God has, the, the grace in your life is to, to make money, financier, to be, to be a financier to be a financier of the kingdom, to help people, to, to, to make a difference. This. That grace, that if you have it, it depends for you to manifest fully. It depends on your prayer life. You can work yourself out without prayer. It will affect the value and the quality. Whatever you do, if it hinders your prayer life, it affects the quality of your work the value of your work, because each work is going to be tested, valued by fire. That is why when people, somebody saying, I'm too busy, I can't pray, I can't go to church, you are too busy, too busy to pray, you must look at the life of Jesus if you are a Christian. He walked everywhere in Jerusalem, in Jericho, Daily, preaching, teaching, healing the sick, setting the captives free. In the evening, he separated himself to go and rest and pray. At times, he prayed through the night. At times, he woke up early morning, Mark 135, to go to a quiet, desert place, desert to pray. So what kind of busy are you that you can't even pray? What kind of busy you are? You are too dangerous. You are too dangerous. You are too busy to pray. Prayer is speaking to the Father. Only prayer makes us to recognize God as God. Nothing else. Tell them, I say, only prayer that makes us to recognize God as God. Yes. That is the only thing that makes us to recognize God as God. That you are God, you are mighty. is prayer. You separate yourself, you go to your room, you go to your garden, you go on your knees, you lift up your hands to the heavens. It's the only thing that makes us to recognize God as God, not just recognizing. To substitute other forces for prayer is to substitute God for material things.
if praying and reading Bible is the second thing you do in your life, it means God has been placed second in all the affairs of your life by yourself. I repeat again. I said, to substitute other forces, such as business, working, socializing, studying, pursuing, if you substitute prayer for other forces, it means you have substituted God for material things. God should be uppermost in our heart. He should be the first and the last. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You start with God, you end with God. You wake up in the morning, you start with God. You go to whatever you are doing. When you come back, you also end with God. When we place prayer, reading the word of God, to be secondary in our life, it means we have placed God to be secondary in all the affairs of our lives. Then look at what follows your life then. If God is number two, everything comes first. My business is first. My marriage is first. My children comes first. Matthew 10, 37. My, my husband first. Read it. Matthew 10, verse 37. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Verse 38. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Verse 39. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Love for Jesus. To substitute prayer for other forces. Your wife is a force. Your mother is a force. Your child is a force. Your business is also a force. To substitute other forces for prayer is to substitute God for material things. To place God secondary. in your life and put all these things first. My wife first, my husband first, my children first, my mother first, my father first, my business first. It means you have placed God secondary. God comes after. But God should be uppermost. First, he's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the beginning and the end. If you love your mother more than me, your father more than me, your husband more than me, your wife more than me, your children more than me, you are not worthy. Jesus said you are not worthy. If you can't take up your cross daily and follow me, you are not worthy. He who tried to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life now will save it. You will get it again in eternity. Yes. You see what is affecting you? You see what is affecting many of you? God is secondary in your life. Everything comes number one. It's number one. God is second place. We talk of Jesus. Okay, Jesus is Lord. Yes, sec of, but second place. 
that will affect the value and the quality of what you do in this earth. Your children are number one. Your work is number one. Your business is number one. God is number two. Okay? Continue. You will continue to be history. We will teach people about you. Even after you died, we will be telling people about you. That is life for you. Continue to put God second. We will tell people about you, of what you have experienced, what you went through. Even after you died, we will be still teaching people about you. Then don't be like, who used to stay this side? Do you remember? Who used to have 20 cars? you remember? Even when you are dead, we will be teaching people about you. Dead! When you are in hell, we will be telling people about you, how arrogant you are. How unfaithful you were. How you put everything before you and got to a second place. We will teach people about you. It's history. History will be telling about you. When we are rebooking, correcting people, your name will not be absent. What is affecting us? God is second place. Everything, first place. You have substituted God for material things. We fail to realize. We fail to realize something. That the things that keeps us so busy do not save the divine end of our peace, our joy, our unity with one another, even in our families. The things that keeps us so busy, this is what we fail to realize. We fail to realize that the things that keep us too busy to pray, they do not serve the divine end of our peace. Our joy, our gratitude, our unity with one another. When prayer is absent in what we do, what we do, Self discontentment, confusion, dissatisfaction. When prayer is absent in what you do, whatever you do will be saving discontentment. You will never be happy. You will make money, you will not enjoy it. There will be so much problems around you. There will be disunity in everything. In your family, there will be disunity in, in your, among your children, among your relatives, war, fight, everything. Many of you, you know what I'm talking about. Because this becomes the result. This is what we fail to realize. You are working hard for money, you are working hard for this, you work at this. If prayer is not part of what you do, what you do, will save discontentment, disunity. Because our working hard without God does not save the divine end of our peace. Jesus said the peace I give is not the peace the world gives. This means there are things we will never, you and I, receive in this world unless we pray to God. Such as peace of heart, security of God's presence. You see those two things. You can make money, you can do this. Peace, 
of heart. That one, it comes through prayer. Security of God's presence comes through prayer. When a robber comes, I say, in the name of Jesus, I enter in the spirit, they will lose the strength of their knees. They will take their heel. You, millionaire, billionaire, you look for bodyguard. If the bodyguard is sleepy, you are in trouble. If they have already killed the bodyguard, you are also in trouble. There are things that you and I, we will never receive or get in this world without prayer. We can get money, we can be the richest in the world. We can have connections everywhere, but security of God's presence, that one, it comes through prayer and commitment to God. Peace of heart, it comes from Jesus. So, my advice to you as a Christian, live a balanced life. Live what? A balanced life. Work hard, make money, but involve God in everything you do. That is what we call a balanced life. Prayer, reading Bible, learning his ways, seeking to please him at all times. That is living a balanced life. What is affecting you? This is what we are talking about today. We are not saying people should not work. Work, but involve God. We don't say, don't, don't get married. No, marry, but involve God in that decision. We don't say, don't do business. No, do business, but involve God. Let God be your guide. Let his word channel your ways. Because his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let that word guide you. Because that word is a mirror. When you read it, it reads you. The Bible is the only book when you read it, and it reads us back. It is the only book when you read it, it will tell you that you are faithful or not. You are arrogant or humble. You are forgiving or you are unforgiving. That is the only book that when you read it, it reads you back. When you read it, it says, forgive Immediately you will see forgive. You start, your memory starts collecting all the people you are angry with. It reads you. That's why when people open it, they only want to read what they want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. When you open it and it says fornicators, drunkards, adulterers, you see a drunkard, fornicator, close the Bible. Huh? Yes. Yes. This is... God has revealed that those who live lustful life, drinking parties, <laughs> one day you open it, I will bless you, and the whole world will bless you. <laughs> Why do you want to hear what your ear wants to hear? You should also want to hear what God wants you to hear. Listen, I want to close my message. It is not sinful things that hurt our life 
and choke our prayer life. But also good things, acceptable things, commendable things, things that are right, things that are in their place by themselves, that are right in themselves, that also hurt our lives and choke our prayer. It is easy for a Christian to fall. You ask me how. Ask me how. I say it is easy for a Christian to fall. When a Christian allow good things, acceptable things, commendable things, to absorb, preoccupy his mind and draw his feeling that a Christian end up forgetting to pray and read the Bible, then what is good has become wrong. That is how a Christian falls. Mark 4, verse 19. What is good has become what? Mark 4, verse 19. But the worries and cares of the world, the distractions of this age with its worldly pleasures, and the deceitfulness and the false security or glamour of wealth or fame, and the passionate desires for all the other things creep in and choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That is it. When we allow good things, clothes, cars, houses, money to lock themselves around our heart excessively that they make us omit or skip our commitment to God and sidetrack us from our Christian journey, then these good right things have become wrong in our life. Money is a good thing, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Clothes, being beautiful, being smart, being this, it's a good thing, but the love of it, if it affects your relationship, your faithfulness, your commitment to God, then that thing is not good anymore. then it's not good anymore. So it is not only sinful things that affect you, Christian. Even good things affect you if you allow them to lock themselves around your heart and absorb you excessively that you even end up forgetting that, hey, I'm a child of God. I don't go to this place. I don't do this. You end up forgetting all the, the commandments, the principles that you have been living with. Then good things have now become wrong. It is so easy. That's why the Bible warns us, we Christians, to watch ourselves. Because it's so easy for a Christian to fall. Not by going to nightclub. By, no, not by heavy men, women, no. By putting God second and any other thing become first. That's how. This is what is affecting you. This is what is affecting us. Our cell phone. Our cell phone. This is a cell phone. If this thing 
make you to forget prayer. This thing now has become wrong. And this thing is good because this makes me to get you now, 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 now. It makes you to send me a message now, you get it now. But if now it allows me now, it starts absorbing and distracting and sidetracking me from my commitment to God, then this good thing has become what? Has become wrong. Anything you regard most in your heart, that is your God. Anything you love in your heart above God, that is your God. Then this cell phone has become what? Your God. You love your mother more than God. Your mother is your God. You love your father more than God. Then that father is that your father is your God now. You love your children more than God. Those children are your gods. Anything you regard most in your heart, that is your God. That's how easy it is for a Christian to fall. Substituting God for material things. Look at this. I'm driving a nice car. The next thing I'm no longer greeting you. That car now has become my, my God. I come out of that Rolls Royce. And I know you. That car has become what? Has become my God. He's telling you not to greet me now. Look what is happening among Christians. Good things have become wrong things. God give us so many good things, we, we, we make them wrong. This technology, Satan is advancing to destroy us. It's from God. It's not from Satan. Satan, where did he get technology? From where? Satan, from where? Who's his mother? It's God. All these good things are from God, but we have allowed them to turn us against God. Who gave them to us? Then these good things have become what? Wrong things. They are now bad now. Our children are so absorbed with social media now. We are now fighting them now. Because they have made a good thing, social media, to become a wrong thing. That social media, if you use it for, to advance your spiritual glory, it will boost you. Now it's for wrong things. Chatting, flirting, good things have become what? Wrong things. Satan is infiltrated down there. And we are not recognizing him. That he's now in, in social media. He's on internet. He's competing. He's a competitor. He's always competing with anything God does, he wants to compete. Let us rise up. We believe you have been blessed by the video you have watched. Follow us on our social media platforms. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell. Like our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. John 14 verse 6, Jesus is the roadmap.